Right, okay. We must be getting close. Actually, that's not bad. I mean, it's going out of phase, but it's not bad. <coughs> Where do you think we need to go now? Still All right, well, I'll have one more try. But hopefully there's enough here to demonstrate what it is I'm wanting to demonstrate. That stayed recognisably in phase for at least two circuits there. Um, <coughs> so this is what I've just tried to do in practice in the previous hour. Um, what that video will come out like, goodness alone knows, I might just look at it for curiosity. Um, but anyway, this is the theory behind it. So this is, vaguely, this is the setup uh, that we had. Um, and as I say, what, I'm, what I was trying to demonstrate and, you know, got halfway close to, I suppose, is that, thank you, uh, is that we can have a system <coughs> set up whereby something's going around at a uniform speed uh, in a circle, so in other words, with an angular frequency that is constant, and a pendulum that's swinging backwards and forwards across the top and if we project one component of this uh, point on the turntable's motion simply by shining a light through it so we're just projecting it on this back screen if we had more time and we were a bit more subtle about what we were doing uh, we could move these two shadows perfectly in phase with one another backwards and forwards across the screen all right so that's the essence of what we're doing here. Now, this seems a very simplistic setup, but actually what we're illustrating here is something generic. So it's going to pertain not only to the swing of a pendulum, and we're going to develop the maths of that as we go through, but also we can describe the motion of masses on springs in exactly the same way, for instance, which might sound esoteric in itself until you remember the whole thing about how we were viewing atoms as being connected to one another by a system of, of springs. So the maths actually that we developed for that, you can use them for studying the vibrations of atoms, believe it or not. And in fact, there's a whole range of, of a whole area of science that's devoted to looking at deviations from this pattern because it tells you something really interesting about the oddities of, of atomic bonding in, um, in materials. All right, so this is our setup. Uh, the ball's going round, uh, as I say, with constant... Uh, angular frequency so there is a period to this rotation t and we've already talked about angular uh, frequency being um, 2 pi f so in other words 2 pi upon t as we <coughs> here we're measuring this remember in radians per second so it's an angle covered per unit time and that is a constant because our disk is going around at constant speed so we have a constant angular frequency. So let's take this as our fixed point, as it suggests on the slide. Uh, and our blob of boot, blue tack, or ball as it's called on this particular figure, is just going round in a circle and coming back to this starting position. OK, so that's fine. We can think about the velocity of this ball. All right, so we just draw a tangent, basically, to the circle, whatever point the ball is at. Um, and that gives us our velocity. So the magnitude of this velocity, the speed in other words, the angular speed is constant because the angular frequency is constant, but the direction of the velocity obviously is going to change from one moment of time to the next because it's going round in a circle. Okay, that's fine as far as it goes. Um, but now we're going to look at you know, we take this as the radius of our circle. Now we're going to look at the <coughs> angle as a function of time. Now this, remember, is going. This ball is going round at a constant number of radians per second. So that measuring that angle there gives us a measure of the time that's lapsed, or the other way round. If we measure the time lapse, 
we've actually got a measure of the angle that's opened up in that triangle uh, because one is proportional to the other. And then remember we're looking at a component of this ball's position. So this is just showing it on one axis. It's, sh it's showing a, a, on this y-axis here. We could equally well do it on the x-axis. Right, so we're just resolving the position of that ball into a position on the y-axis and as I say equivalently we could drop a perpendicular and say well what is the component of that ball's position on the x-axis as well. So in other words we could give x and y coordinates at any moment in time for the position of that ball. And all we're doing is dropping a perpendicular to that axis or one down to here. So this line here in our right angle triangle is necessarily r times cosine theta. If we were looking at the component on the x-axis, what would be the length of that line down there? r sine theta. All right, we're just resolving it into components. So you've done all that before. This is familiar territory to you. <coughs> okay, so now look, let's look at this um, shadow, as it were, of the ball on here. So this component, the component in the y-axis. So as this goes round at a constant angular frequency, this is just going to oscillate up and down. Right? As the ball goes round here and then back up the other side again, this is going to come down here and then back up again. So if we plot this position out, the length of this line, in other words, r times cosine theta as a function of time, what we're going to get is an oscillation right, as this thing goes up and down. And that's exactly what's being plotted out here. So it's just the component, this component measured back on that axis. And you'll see, surprise, surprise, it's going to look rather like a sine wave. In fact, it is a sine wave. And that's not going to surprise you because we've already established that the length of that side is a cosine, the length of that side is a sine. Whichever direction we look in, we're going to have a sinusoidal wave. One might be 90 degrees out of phase with the other, but then nevertheless, a sinusoidal wave. <coughs> yeah? So always that's going to happen. So up here, we're going to take this as a positive uh, length. Obviously, when it's down here, it's going to be a negative length. So we're just going to continue <coughs> to get this positive, negative sinusoidal uh, oscillation. So we've already got some link to what we've been talking about all the way through this module as what is a wave. Right? It's a repeated sinusoidal to and fro motion. Those are the sort of words that we've been using uh, umpteen times as we've gone through. All right, now. Given that our pendulum bob in the setup, if it worked, uh, is as exactly in phase with that ball on the disc uh, going round and round, we can also now describe the displacement of the pendulum bob away from its equilibrium position, in other words, so the centre of the swing, uh, using that component, as we had on the previous slide, along one axis. So let's assume then our pendulum is swinging in this direction as well. We can use the length of that line to describe the position of our pendulum bob. So. so the displacement of the pendulum bob from its equilibrium <coughs> position is also then given by our cosine theta. And theta, remember, again, skip back a slide, uh, theta is omega t. All right? Two, th we're measuring theta in radians, remember. This is all in radians per second if we're looking at omega. So a complete circuit is 2 pi radians. Yes? <coughs> so the number of radians per unit time is 2 pi upon the period. <coughs> Multiply that by the actual time that's lapsed. Right? Half a period, quarter of a period, whatever it is. Uh, then uh, we have um, the position of our ball at that moment in time. And we already know by definition that omega is 2 pi upon the period, so here's omega. 
So we can write our angle in radians <coughs> as omega times t. Alright? So where I've got r cosine theta here, I can equivalently write r cosine omega t. Because theta, remember, is changing at a constant rate with time. So one is directly proportional to the other. So we jolly well ought to be able to make these relationships up here. That, I hope, is fairly intuitive. So here we've got our displacement then of the pendulum ball, R times cos omega t. OK? So we can now produce a measure of the velocity. If we've got the displacement, all we need to do is differentiate it with respect to time, right? That's our next step. So if we want to get V, we just differentiate this. Which you'll all remember, it'll trip off the tongue. Right? You differentiate cosine uh, x, you get minus sine x, right? If you differentiate cosine constant times x, you get con minus constant times the sine, yeah? And that's exactly what we've done here. Omega is a constant. Here's our variable, which is our substitute for theta, in other words. So if I differentiate that with respect to time, what I'm going to get uh, is, where have I written it down here? Um, here it is. I'll just get that. So the velocity with which our pendulum bob is moving is now given by a relatively simple equation as well. And you'll notice this is also a sinusoidal wave. So the velocity of our pendulum bob is itself varying sinusoidally with time. All right? There's some constants in there. Uh, omega and R are both constants. But nevertheless, uh, it's, um, it's giving us the, uh, the velocity. Now notice the minus sign. The minus sign is important and it comes because of our choice of what is positive and what is negative. Right? So we're always measuring with respect to the equilibrium position. So if we've got a positive displacement, in other words we've moved away from equilibrium, right, the velocity is going to be in the other direction. And as I say, we've just got that by differentiating this. All right, so here's our equation for the velocity of the pendulum ball. All right, now we can do a little bit of very, very simple um, algebra here, or trigonometry, depending on how you want to view it. So we've got two equations. We've got a displacement, uh, which is a function of cosine, and we've got a velocity uh, which is a function of sine. So I'm going to square both of these. And in the case of the top one, I'm going to multiply both sides by omega squared as well. Right? So I've got s squared equals r squared, cosine squared omega t, and then I'm going to stick an omega squared on both sides as well, the reasons for which I hope will be obvious in a line or two's time. So here's our equation for the velocity. I'm going to square that as well. So I get v squared. The minus sign, of course, will disappear when I square this. So I'll have omega squared, r squared, sine squared on the right-hand side. So if I then add these two uh, together and take out common factors, that's the reason I put the omega squared in up here, I get a sine squared plus a cosine squared, which is just 1. All right? So I end up with a very simple relationship then between the velocity and displacement and r. And r is, for our pendulum, is going to be equivalent to the amplitude. That's the radius of the circle, right? So that's how far our pendulum bob is going to swing. Out to the radius on one side, through the equilibrium position, out to the radius on the other side. So take the square root of this thing, here's our velocity, it's now equal to angular uh, frequency and then this simple relationship here, amplitude squared minus displacement squared. 
square root of. There's a plus or minus, of course, having taken the square root. And you would expect that anyway physically. Because remember, we've got a pendulum bob that's moving out this way and then back again in the other direction. So there has to be a plus and a minus in there somewhere. Now, if we've got the velocity of our pendulum bob, of course, we can also produce the acceleration in exactly the same way. We just differentiate it again with respect to time. So I'm going to produce dv by dt, basically. So here it is. Here's v in the bracket. dv by dt is uh, the acceleration. All right, now we can simplify this. Let's see if you can work through this with me. We've got... What we need to do is to differentiate uh, our velocity... All right, actually, we could rewrite this and make our lives a little bit simpler because these things are constant, right? That's the amplitude and the angular frequency. So I can stick those out there. Makes life a little bit easier. So now we've got to differentiate sine omega t with respect to t. So what is this? Sorry, say that again. Negative omega sine omega t. All right. Any advance <coughs> on that? You need to brush up on your trigonometry. If we differentiate a sine, we get a yeah, cosine. All right. So we're necessarily going to have cosine omega t in here, but there is one more step. Yeah. So we have the constant coming out the front. All right, so see what we've got here. We've got minus uh, omega squared r cosine omega t. All right, that's our acceleration. That's dv by dt. Okay, but what is r cos omega t? just the displacement. So we can make that substitution. <coughs> we can replace r cos omega t by the displacement. And that's the equation you can see in the other at the bottom of the slide there. So we've differentiated the displacement twice with respect to time to give us our acceleration. And this is the foundational equation, essentially, for simple harmonic motion. So if you remember one equation in all this, that is the one to remember. And we're going to do, we're going to generate our definition for simple harmonic motion from that equation, essentially. <coughs>